I hurt my back earlier, so I'm hoping basically I don't actually end up doing myself another injury and falling over all the cables. I feel like I'm going for a walk in the park. Uh, right. So, thank you for joining us, everybody. I'm just hooking up. There you go. Now, this worked earlier. Moment of truth, as they say. All right. So, well, I think we are good. So, uh, as Paula said, my name is Matthew Griffin. I'm the CEO and founder of the 311 Institute. Uh, I work with all of the companies that you have on you right now. So, companies like Microsoft, Visa, Arm, Samsung, and lots, lots more. So, as I say, so I work with all of the companies basically in your pockets. Uh, and what I do is I work with those companies to actually help them envision the future. Now, I also work with all G20 governments, and so when we actually have a look at the things like the future of transportation, healthcare, energy, infrastructure, uh, welfare, state, and so on and so forth, I cover all of those. But I kind of look at two futures. Now, I look at what I regard as the future, which is the next 20 years. Now, that's where the vast majority of multinational organizations typically spend their time, in that sort of 5, 10, 20-year horizon. Uh, and we're seeing a lot more disruption, basically, in that particular space. But I also work up to 50 years out into the deep future, because if you have a look at governments, uh, governments typically care about the longer-term view, especially when we're having a look at the future of education, jobs and skills, transportation, infrastructure, healthcare, energy, and all these other things that we kind of care about. Now, when we start talking about the future of transportation, the fact of the matter is everything is connected, literally and figuratively. So this is the agenda that I've put together. Because when we're trying to figure out what the future of transportation and infrastructure in the state actually looks like, it's reliant on a huge number of factors. It's reliant on all of the different industries, all of the different trends, all of the different technologies, and that's today. And then we're trying to actually push the timelines out 30 years as well. So we're almost trying to cover every sector almost every trend, almost every technology, to a timeline of 2055. And if you have a look at the past, say, three months, it's, we've been trying to change the global education system for about the past 100, 150 years. Artificial intelligence, basically, has a breakthrough, and all of a sudden, everybody globally goes, we must change the education system. Oh my gosh. That's in the past three months, let alone the next 30 years. So this is what I'm going to be going through. Now, when we have a look at the future, it used to be the case that it was described in this term, VUCA. Volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. However, if you go to California, because the Californians like adding acronyms, they've now coined MAX, because the changes are typically massive, and I will show you those. Everything's accelerating. When we have a look at the impact, basically, of artificial intelligence just in the last three months on every single job category on the planet and every country on the planet, suddenly everyone is in this major hype cycle. And then it's exp exponential. When we, have a look at when we have a look at most technologies, they don't just develop at a relatively slow rate forever and ever and ever. They accelerate. If we have a look at, for example, at lithium-ion batteries, the energy density in a typical lithium-ion battery was increasing at really about 2% per year, and that was pushing the boundary. However, as we start seeing electric vehicles basically coming to the forefront, those same lithium-ion batteries can be used in aircraft. They can be used in cargo ships, et cetera, et cetera. So all of a sudden, the investors now start pouring more money into energy innovations, which means that the energy density in batteries is now increasing by about 400 to 500%. So there are lots of different things that have to come together for us to start accelerating the future. Now, in order to try to sort of put this in simple terms, because it's not simple, I write these codexes. So if you scan the QR code, you can download these. And um, when we're trying to figure out what the future looks like, there are 250 megatrends in this one. Every single trend in here impacts everything that you do, directly or indirectly. But then when we actually have a look at technologies, 
there are over 300 exponential technologies in here. AI, blockchain, 5G, virtual reality, gene editing are just five of the technologies that we actually have to have a look at. So when we're trying to put this picture of the future together, these are some of the trends basically, that we are trying to figure out. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to understand, firstly, what these trends are at an individual level. Then we're trying to understand what happens when these different trends come together and combine. What is their direct or indirect impact on the thing that we care about? Now, when we have a look at technology, technology is already destroying half of global GDP. So $50 trillion worth of value is being destroyed. Now, if we have a look at, for example, the oil and gas industry, if I spent $4 billion basically building an oil rig, in the 1980s, 1990s, it would have an asset value of arguably $4 billion. I work with companies like BP, Shell, Exxon, and everything else. Today, that oil rig does not have a value of $4 billion. In fact, that is a drag basically on most organizations' pockets. So when we actually have a look at value destruction, increasingly, we are moving away we are increasingly moving away from oil and gas and we're embracing renewables. That's part of a $92 trillion shift. When we actually have a look at, for example, vehicles, companies like Volkswagen will have spent tens of billions of dollars building vehicle factories that produce internal combustion engine vehicles. They're now having to switch. In the case of Volkswagen, they've just invested $48 billion to secure lithium supplies but they've had to change all of their manufacturing facilities to manufacture EVs or hybrids. So on the one hand, there's a huge amount of value destruction going on. But on the other hand, it's estimated that there is up to $210 trillion up for grabs. So if you have a look, for example, at the energy transition, it's a $92 trillion energy transition according to Bloomberg Neff over the next 30 years. That's new markets, that's new value that is being created. So we kind of have this push me, pull you. There are threats, but there are opportunities as well. Now, when we actually have a look at technology, technology does this. Over time, the cost performance of the technology that we care about drops exponentially in its cost performance. So for example, if you wanted to speak to somebody in Australia today on a video call, how much would it cost you? Nothing, right? Wi-Fi connection. When we have a look at the cost of moving money around the planet, zero. When we actually have a look at the cost of creating increasingly sophisticated artificial intelligences, Stanford recreated ChatGPT for 600 bucks. So the cost performance drops exponentially. When we have a look at things like gene, gene sequencing, 20 years ago it was $1 billion to sequence one human genome. Now it's $150 and you can do it in five hours. So when we're trying to actually plot out what the future looks like, on the one hand, we, are obey we have to obey this rule, but on the other hand, we need to try to forecast what all this means. If you look at lithium ion batteries, for example, I can show you polymer batteries that will charge an EV in 30 seconds. Technology lets us do things that are unexpected. But it also does this. Especially digital technologies help us decentralize, dematerialize, democratize, and disrupt different industries. 
Okay? Now, for example, if we're in a rural area, and we were kind of talking about this last night, this is not a smartphone. This is a tricorder. Right? Because if I use artificial intelligence and the camera, this, wherever I am on the planet, can now tell me if I have the onset of pancreatic cancer, skin cancer. It can tell me what, what, what my heart rate is, my blood pressure is. AI plus the accelerometer can tell me if I'm having the onset of a heart attack. AI plus the microphone can tell me if I have dementia, PTSD, and all kinds of other things. So even in primary and secondary healthcare, technology is letting us decentralize things. When we have a look at work, we can work from the beach, we can work from the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. So as we start having a look at the future of transportation, pretty much every service that you can think of, including heart surgery, can be decentralized. I can be standing here on a 5G network, and we've done it. You can speak to Verizon and all these other companies. And I can be doing heart surgery on somebody in any other part of the planet, let alone construction, which we'll come to. So when we start having a look at all the different technologies, this is really what we're trying to forecast out. Because the future products and services that you're going to use, develop, deploy, invest in, fund, and so on and so forth, are a combination of technologies. AI is one technology, but it needs to run on computer chips. When you have a look at your smartphone, it's a display, it's a modem, it's storage, it's all kinds of different things. So we combine all these different exponential technologies, and this wheel goes out to 2075. And all of a sudden, a lot of things change. 3D printing, for example, fundamentally changes the advanced manufacturing sector. Because if I'm Adidas, I can 3D print trainers in the back of my store. And they're doing that. The impact of that means that I, as Adidas, I don't need to make 100 million sneakers in Shanghai and import them through the ports. So 3D printing lets us collapse global supply chains. We've got bioreactors, basically which we can actually use in the agritech sector. So a bioreactor means that you can take the cell from an animal and turn it into a beef burger. The US FDA has just approved cultivated meat for sale in the entire United States. So when we talk about that individual technology, California, for example, sees that as a $60 billion export opportunity, because I've been with California. And biotech and compute, you know, when we talk about compute, we've got quantum computers coming through. So when we talk about being able to optimize traffic flows throughout all of Louisiana, quantum computers are billions of times faster than the US's fastest supercomputers. What takes the US Department of Energy's summit supercomputer three billion years to do, no word of a lie, these quantum computers can do in seconds because we've done it. So traffic flows are an optimization problem. Companies like Volkswagen are already using quantum computers to optimize Uber-like traffic flows. We've got 5G, but as we start pushing out to 2055, we end up with 6G and all kinds of other things. So as you can see, all of these different technologies, when you combine them together, they either disrupt one industry or everything. And then it's a case of what do they do, what do they enable, what do they disrupt. But when we talk about the future, ultimately we're trying to do three things. Most futurists kind of look at the why and the how. What's the problem that we're trying to solve? That's an innovation problem. You're trying to find the problems. How are we going to solve those problems? That's a combination of technology problems, autonomous vehicles. But then we care about the when. When? Is this new product or service that we've created going to be the status quo? When's it going to be the norm? So for example, if we take electric, if we take autonomous vehicles, why? What's the problem we're solving? Reducing deaths on the roads, for example. How do we do that? Well, we take a car, pack it with sensors and artificial intelligence and machine vision, and we end up with a car that drives itself. But when will everybody be able to get into an autonomous vehicle? Well, if you wanted to switch every vehicle to an autonomous vehicle, 
it's going to take about 20, 20 years to make enough of them. So that's a manufacturing problem. But also, some people just say, I don't want to get into an autonomous vehicle. I just don't like them, don't trust them. If you can't insure those autonomous vehicles, people can't get in them. If they aren't affordable, people won't buy them. If they aren't accessible, if they're not accessible or available in Louisiana or in Baton Rouge, you're not going to be able to get into them. If your friends aren't using them, you're probably not going to use it yourself. Standards, if the standards aren't there, then we have problems with interoperability. If the regulators basically say, no, you can't actually drive or can't get into an autonomous vehicle in Louisiana, you can't get into them. So it's the when. And typically what we find is when a new technology comes out, a new thing, culturally, it takes about 20 years for it to become the norm. So even though we have all these wonderful technologies today, the fact of the matter is, we aren't all in autonomous vehicles today, even though Waymo, basically over in Texas, have got over a thousand of them, a thousand of them driving around. Even though GM have just bought 65,000 cars. The reason why we're not actually in them at the moment is because of all these different factors at the bottom. Now, when we talk about acceleration, there are a number of different things that we need to think about. So there are three speeds of change, and this is important from a transportation perspective because actually you are dealing with all of these speeds of change. There's digital. So for example, basically, if we want to push a firmware update basically to a vehicle, we can create the software, we can push it out, we can change that vehicle's features and functions within a couple of days, a couple of weeks, whatever, but fairly quick. In the future, Software will be delivered and created increasingly by machines, like AIs, before it's even needed, because we can take lots of different data, and these systems, which are already doing this, will predict that you need this particular kind of software and deploy it before you even need it. So we don't get to real time, we go to predictive. When we talk about physical, so think about physical infrastructure. If I said to you, right, today I want you to go and rip apart a bridge because it's failing, and replace it, to replace it, any kind of infrastructure is typically years, maybe it's even decades. However, 2055, we'll be able to replace a failing bridge within weeks. And I'll show you how. And then we've got the speed of government, which is uh, <laughs> very quick, obviously. <laughs> yeah, see, there's no, no laughing. So, when we think about the future of transportation, this kind of matters because you've got disconnects between digital assets, physical assets, and the speed of acceleration. And we're trying to balance all of these at the moment. Now, from a machine perspective, AIs are increasingly creating their own hardware and software products. So, on the left, that is a single stage rocket engine that was designed by an artificial intelligence in Germany called Hyperganic, and it can be 3D printed. We don't need to ship rocket component parts. We just print it off. This is the Under Armour sneaker. Under Armour would normally take 18 months to go from concept to shelf. This was designed by an artificial intelligence in the morning. It's called the Architect sneaker. It's $300, and 3D printed in the afternoon. So when we think about supply chains and logistics and everything else, the speed at which we can create physical products is also accelerating. And then we have AIs creating software, AIs creating AIs and all kinds of nutty stuff. And that's today. Now, in addition to that, when we have a look at the power of the individual, every single person within Louisiana irrespective of their ability or background, is the most powerful version of themselves that has ever lived. Because the cost of building a business has fallen by 20,000% over the past 10 years. If you want to start a business today, get a GoDaddy website, download WordPress for free, get AI increasingly to build your website for you, develop your products, basically build your store, do your marketing for you and everything else, push it out. So increasing capital, capital access, increasing market access, 
I can be sitting here, I can start a digital business, and if I know how to execute, I can have my products in front of three billion people by the end of the day. And then resources. If I need resources, hey, I just email someone, I just reach out or DM somebody. So the ability for individuals basically to actually create businesses and scale businesses and get products out to whoever they're getting products out to has never been as much as has never been as fast as it is today. Which then means that from a disruption perspective, you can have an Elon Musk sitting in Louisiana that goes, I've got an idea. And they've got faster access to capital markets and resources. Which then means basically that you can have faster disruption. Because if one person has a decent idea, now basically they can start executing it. Now, we typically think basically of the gig economy as being human. So 36% of millennials in the US work in the gig economy. By 2055, the gig economy will mostly be machines. So I'll give you an example. This is a piece of artwork that I created using an artificial intelligence because AI is now at that level. A year ago, if I wanted a piece of artwork, I would have gone to a human on Fiverr and said, I want you to create a picture that looks a bit like this uh, for a presentation. And they'd have created something, I'd have paid them 20 bucks or five bucks, whatever. Now, I just go straight to AI. So we think about the gig economy as being human, but actually I'm seeing the rise of the machine gig economy. I can go to these AIs and I can get them to write code as well. So that starts undermining some of the workforce basically within the state. In addition to that, by the time we start getting to 2025 or 2055, we have this. We've got 15 of these already. We've got artificial intelligences that have created companies, that operate companies, and scale companies, especially in the social media space, the communication space, and in Wall Street, fully autonomously. So in 2055, if you think all the businesses are going to be run by humans, with humans in them, Uber, for example, is the perfect example of a company that can become fully autonomous. And then one other company that can be fully autonomous that you might have heard of is Amazon. Amazon has all of the patents that it needs to get AIs to design clothes and products, make those on demand in their warehouses, and then do fully autonomous fulfillment and shipment. So when we have a look at the future of employment, workforce, and everything else, it's dramatically different. Now, we also have this. As an individual industry digitizes, or as an individual business digitizes itself, it's easier than ever before for that individual business to move into new markets. So if you speak to, say, for example, a Ford, and say, what industry are you in? Ford will say, well, we are in the business of selling cars. If you speak to a tech company and say, what business are you in, Google, Amazon, Facebook, they would just go, we're in all of them. We're in retail, and we're in healthcare, and we're in financial services, and we're in this and that and everything else. So what we're seeing is as industries digitize, we are seeing technology convergence, but also sector convergence. And this applies basically to the transportation space. And I'll show you how. We now end up in the super app era. Now, we know basically that platforms like, say, WeChat, WhatsApp, increasingly they're super, they're super apps. But what about Mercedes? In China, basically, China have an electric vehicle company called NEO. They sell lifestyle products. They sell food products. They also sell electric vehicles. But if we take Mercedes, if we have a car that drives itself, it's just a blank space inside. It's a pod, right? So if I have a thing, a pod, that drives itself around the state, and I'm now Mercedes, why can't I, as Mercedes, say, I tell you what, I will offer you mobility as a service. I will offer you meeting room as a service, shop as a service, GP surgery as a service, entertainment as a service. Mercedes starts getting into the payment business as well. So when we start having a look at the future business models, basically, of a lot of the vehicle manufacturers, that changes. 
Now, when we actually have a look at transportation, it's not about transportation, it's about mobility. Now, tomorrow, we're going to be moving goods and people. So today, we think of transportation as moving goods and people from A to Z. But increasingly in the future, transportation will move services. And I will show you what that means soon. Which means that the transportation hubs within Louisiana can do these two things. I can sell you mobility as a service, and then I can sell you mobile services. Because if you have a car that drives itself, I can call it up. But that car that drives itself, because it's a pod, could be a shop. Now I'm calling a shop up. In Finland, fully autonomous vehicles could actually have a sauna in them and other things. And in fact, here, which means basically that from a Department of Transportation perspective, why isn't Louisiana a super app? If you were a private business, not a public business, you'd be developing a super app where you say, whatever you actually want as a citizen, mobility as a service, education as a service, whatever it happens to be, as a viable health as a service, everything's available via the super app. So when we start thinking about funding and business models, there are new business models that you can actually hook into, provided the legislature lets you. And then when we think about the future of transportation, we need to design for humans and machines. Because the fact of the matter, if you look at the I-10, for example, you'll have autonomous trucks running up and down it. But you might still end up with a couple of people who want to drive their own cars. And this is very different. You design a road in a set of infrastructure for humans in a very different way to the machines. So for example, if you take the I-10, if you had fully autonomous vehicles and you've got eight lanes, you've got the center lane reservation, you could take that away. And you could have artificial intelligence running the lanes in whatever way it feels like. The right-hand lane can be running north, the second lane in running south, the third lane in running north, the fourth lane in running north, whatever. So when we start talking about things like transportation and capaci capacity utilization, at the moment, highways are divided into this one goes north, this one goes south. And this one can be congested, and this one's got nothing on it. But you can't switch traffic flows between them. So infrastructure is inflexible in that way. Now, when you actually have a look at the purpose of transportation, because again, we kind of got to get to the why. Why do we actually move things around? What are we really trying to actually achieve? I think it comes down to this. The purpose of transportation is to facilitate interactions. I want to see my family. I want to go to the shops. I want to go to work. Maybe I don't want to go to work, but anyway. But also move value. I need to move $396 billion of goods, basically from the coast, basically up through the rest of the United States. So when we're trying to look at the future of transportation, I think these are the two anchors. When we have a look at the future, what interactions are we trying to facilitate between people and things? people and people, whatever it happens to be. And what value are we moving? Because value is different. Value can be oil, gas. It can be goods, but it can also be people. Now, one of the biggest problems that we actually have with transportation in the future is the problem that we've always had, funding. There's never, ever enough funding going around. Now, if you have a look at Louisiana, since 1980, the state has been subject to over $290 billion of climate damage. The number of insurers within Louisiana that are going out of business has increased dramatically. So as we start looking forward at a future basically that is possibly dominated by climate change and extreme weather events, it's all very well having the money to build the new bridges, but what happens basically when a Category 6 hurricane smashes straight through it all? Now, in the US, as well as in Japan, we are now starting to talk about hurricane categories in terms of category six classifications, because most of the big hurricanes are running at the top of category five classifications. Now, as I travel around the world, basically quite a lot of the smart cities, especially, are run by CEOs, not mayors. They run the cities as businesses. 
as a business would. We can move from PFI, basically, to public wealth. So in the UK, we've typically unlocked about $12 billion worth of public wealth, which we reinvest into, uh, in our case, basically the subway networks and the train networks. So when we have a look at unlocking public wealth, that's another sort of funding opportunity there. Crypto cities. Technology lets us do very, very strange things. Now, in Miami and New York, they've both been part of a project, an experiment called the CityCoin project. So Miami has been mining cryptocurrency. They give 70% of the profits of that to their citizens, and the state takes 30% of the yield, converts that out to cash, dollars. Now, it's an experiment. It's had its ups and downs and everything else. But in Miami's case, they raised $30 million without ever having to go to the bank. They cashed out. So crypto cities. This is a Web3 blockchain kind of technology. So for example, what would actually happen in Miami's case, the Miami mayor a little while ago, and his aspirations haven't really been met, said, I want to be earning $400 million a year from crypto mining so that I can go to my citizens on a public platform and say, I'm eliminating all taxes for you. But we still take that money and we invest it in infrastructure and all kinds of other things. So imagine running on a platform where you say, so what we're going to do is we're going to eliminate all taxes, but actually we're going to invest even more in transportation, infrastructure, and everything else. Now, when we have a look at vehicles themselves, as you start moving to a fully autonomous vehicle, it's packed full of computing power, general processing units, GPUs from companies like NVIDIA. So in the US, we have companies like uh, Daymac, as your car basically is parked up at home, it's mining cryptocurrency. Now imagine this, and these are all nascent, but this is today, not 2055. Now imagine basically that you've got a lot of semi-autonomous or fully autonomous public transit vehicles. Buses, you know, you've got a whole variety of different things. Railways. What happens basically when all your vehicles can mine their own cryptocurrency on a 5G or 6G network? Can you take the money from this and start actually investing it into transportation? When we have a look at IoT infrastructure, T-Mobile has just teamed up with what we call a crypto carrier called Helium. So your data moves off the T-Mobile network and onto a set of miniature routers about the size of that coffee cup. And that coffee cup will mine cryptocurrency. And that Helium network is earning people $10,000 a year generally. But now imagine that you're starting to hook up smart infrastructure. You're packing sensors onto bridges. You're making your cities smart. Have you ever thought, basically, that your IoT infrastructure could actually mine cryptocurrency and make you money that you could invest back into the transportation system? At no point is the state ever, is the federal government really going to go, hey, by the way, we're going to give you a ton load of extra money. That'll be a once in a blue moon affair. And tokenization, everything is a unit of value in this world, everything. This is a whole conversation in itself. So for example, if the state has now developed its own artificial intelligence algorithm to manage traffic flows, five years ago, you couldn't monetize it. You could maybe license it, but that's it. Now, you can tokenize the state's artificial intelligence algorithm, sell shares in it to whoever on the planet via Singapore exchanges and get money in. But it's real money. So now we can raise capital without banks. So when we actually think about the infrastructure, this is the digital piece. Think about how you might be able to actually use new funding and business models with that digital piece because this could get you some extra money. Now, global trends. So this presentation has a lot. Follow the trend lines, not the headlines. If you follow the headlines, you're going to end up in dead ends and spinning your tails. Uh, but when we actually have a look at economic trends, global economic trends, there's a lot going on. So we've got global GDP growth. So by 2055, global GDP should be double what it is today. 
coming from 32 countries. So when you actually have a look at the ports of Louisiana, for example, Latin America, Brazil is actually going to be one of the top 10 uh, countries by GDP. So when you're start, starting to look at the future of logistics and supply chains, that matters. Global reserve currency wars, international migration, that's going to, be, that's going to become increasingly problematic. Mega cities, people are moving more to mega cities, but actually by 2040, we could see about 54 mega cities being underwater. So whether it is actually Shanghai, whether it's part of New Orleans, whether it's London, Miami, which is increasingly flooding. But we're also going to have more wealth inequality. So these are trends basically that persist through to 2055. Now the reason why we have more wealth inequality is because AI is actually already starting to take jobs which is a conversation in itself. Now, when we have a look at the environment, climate change isn't going anywhere, basically, in the timeline that we care about. Global sea level rise. Global sea levels are rising at about three millimeters per year. Now, from a New Orleans perspective, that means that you're, or from a Louisiana perspective, that means that you're going to have saltwater ingress, basically, into your freshwater aquifers, which is going to affect agriculture. Agricultural yields are going to fall. We've got resource scarcity, because governments are increasingly fighting over Cobalt, lithium, rare earth metals, all that kind of stuff. Sustainability will still be on track, and water scarcity and stress will increase, depending on what part of the planet you're on. Um, so when we have a look at water scarcity and stress, it's estimated by the United Nations that 129 countries on Earth by 2030 will be fighting over water. When we talk about political trends, we are moving from a world basically where the US is the dominant driving force to a bipolar world. So this creates tensions basically between the US and China and other emerging economies like India, which means basically that from a logistics perspective, we're seeing China invest almost $2 trillion in the Belt and Road Initiative. So this is ports, infrastructure, transportation infrastructure, and so on and so forth. Bipolar world, that's leading to an innovation cold war. In China, basically, they are investing $1.4 trillion promoting and developing emerging technologies compared to the US, which is about $400 billion if you include the, IRA, the um, IRA, IRA and the CHIPS Act. Uh, we've got net zero pledges and we've got strategic dislocation. Now, this is maybe an opportunity for Louisiana because increasingly from a supply chain perspective, we're seeing more supply chains moving onshore and friendshoring. So, we're seeing manufacturing centers coming out of China, for example, and going to Vietnam, to India, or whatever it happens to be. So bearing in mind that you've got a lot of ports, that is another opportunity. So when you're thinking about the partnerships that you build, do you build a partnership with, say, China, or do you build the partnership instead with India or Vietnam, and so on and so forth? So strategic dislocation is already happening, and it's actually an opportunity, but one you need to be aware of. Societally, basically, we've got an aging population, an algorithmic society, increasingly AIs basically will tell us who to trust, what to trust, what to do. The AIs are increasingly saying, I bought you some goods. Uh, I've routed all your traffic for you, whatever. Uh, global energy demand is going off the scale. So when we have a look at electric vehicles, it's estimated that you need triple the amount of electricity today if every car was an EV. So for example, from the Louisiana energy grid, could you accommodate a tripling of electricity demand? Particularly if you've got 44% of people that say that they're very likely to buy an EV. And bearing in mind that when we have a look at electric vehicles, the cost of electric vehicles is falling. So those 44% 44 people, 44 of people today that say we would buy an EV, those EVs are like $60,000 or more. Those are coming down. So that's going to increase. Global population growth by 2055 will have about 10.5 billion people on the planet and huge amounts of jobs automation. If you're not very careful, that will go straight through every part of society and increase inequality like you will never believe. From a technology perspective, though, we've got artificial intelligence and quantum technologies, robotics, synthetic biology, and Web3. So Web3 is a very good opportunity for you to actually finance new things in new ways. And AI will be strapped into absolutely everything. Now, from a sector perspective, so these are the sectors that typically you care about. These are the trends that will be consistent from 2030 to 2055. Because when we're having a look at the future of transportation strategy, 
what we're trying to anchor ourselves on is the things that we know will change, the constants. So increasingly, we will have biodiversity collapse, climate damage. Basically, when we have a look at Louisiana's um, agricultural sector, it's already being damaged by the climate, floods, whatever it happens to be. Declining yields, according to the, uh, the US uh, government, uh, barley, wheat, and a variety of other crop yields are declining by 30%. And most of that, when you have a look at the insurance uh, books, most of that is climate damage and pest uh, damage. Food insecurity, every country I travel to, every single government goes, we kind of care about a couple of things. Food insecurity, energy insecurity, rising inflation. If we have more people on the planet and we're losing, and we, we see declining yields, we've got more food insecurity, more people fighting over food. In Louisiana, the technologies I'll show you give you an opportunity to rapidly and expansively increase the exports. Uh, so we've got f food inflation, soil degradation, water scarcity and stress. Rising sea level will just end up uh, obliterating quite a lot of the soils. Now, the bullets in orange are the ones, if you're going to focus on anything, focus on those. Okay? I mean, every single one of these areas I'm going into is like an hour presentation by itself. In 2030, basically, we care about precision agriculture and we care about robotic automation. So increasingly, we see more robotic automation throughout the agricultural sector. And we also see automation, digitization, and smart stuff. So that's kind of throughout every sector. If we start heading towards 50, 2055, though, we see alternative proteins coming through. So this is where we can make proteins out of thin air. That is a massive opportunity that in Malaysia and in the Far East, they are absolutely embracing like crazy. Because as we see a growing population, we need more protein. So alternative proteins is one. Cellular agriculture, as I mentioned earlier, you take the cell from an animal, put it into a bioreactor, and you grow a chicken nugget. Or a beef burger, or bacon, or pork belly. It's called cellular agriculture because it literally uses cells. So what we do is we do what an animal does, grow flesh, without the animal. That is a massively ramping business. We've got vertical farming as well. When we have a look at vertical farming, we can grow eight times the crops in 350 times less space with zero herbicides, zero pesticides. We can extract water from the air, so it's 0% zero, zero from potable water. It can be powered by renewable energy, but more importantly, these crop yields are guaranteed. Now, I sat down basically with a whole bunch of folks in California in the ag sector. The Californian agricultural sector exports $40 billion a year. Using these three pieces here, they reckon that they can push their exports just to the United States to $100 billion. So your agricultural sector actually has an opportunity like they've never, ever seen before. Because this is a modern farm. It's completely sustainable. The more carbon dioxide that you pump into it, the bigger the plants grow. And if you're pumping carbon dioxide into one of these, you get carbon credits. They are building these outside of New York. Jeff Bezos has invested $250 million. Every Walmart warehouse and Amazon warehouse is going to have one of these in them. It is organic produce sold below supermarket prices. Now when we have a look at construction, so construction basically we have, the trends basically still keep going, aging infrastructure, climate damage, which we've already seen $290 billion worth of variety of 
difference of damages basically within Louisiana over the past 43 years. Decentralized services, funding crunches, you're never going to end up, you're never going to actually be able to keep up with funding. And even if, the, even if the state gave you all the funding that you need and said, here you go, it's still going to take you a significant amount of time to repair the infrastructure that you've actually got. And by the time you've repaired the infrastructure you've got, it's going to be starting to fall apart somewhere else again. So infrastructure is also inflexible. We've seen rapid urbanization, and we're seeing urban heat islands. Now, the, really, it's the first two that we sort of want to focus on. When we actually have a look at the technologies that we have today, on the one hand, we've got green cities, basically, which actually start taking the heat out of the cities. So that's urban planning. But materials innovation is a major one. So for example, we have carbon negative and carbon neutral concrete. Now, earlier, uh, the chap mentioned uh, Louisiana's carbon capture system. So what we'll do is we'll take carbon dioxide out of the air, we pump it underground, okay? Why? Because if you take carbon dioxide out of the air and you turn it into limestone, you can actually put it into concrete and then you end up with carbon negative or carbon neutral concrete. Plus, limestone is a byproduct that you can actually sell and upscale. So this is where you can start tying all these different industries together to create different hubs within Louisiana, which we then sort of connect up. Modular infrastructure. Now, say, for example, we had a critical a bridge over there that was critical. You'd have to close it. You'd have to do the repairs. Maybe you have to demolish it. You know, it's closed for two years, something like that, right? Modular infrastructure. You build the infrastructure off-site, then you simply move it on. When we talk about resilient infrastructure, when we have a look at companies like Arup, they are designing infrastructure that is designed to flood. So, especially in Europe now, we have infrastructure that is designed to flood. And when it floods, everyone just moves away or they treat it as a different kind of utility space. So, when we talk about resilient infrastructure as well though, we've got self-healing infrastructure. So, I was walking around on the levees. Okay. You can see the cracks in the levees. And what someone has done is someone has taken some form of polymer, some glue or whatever it happens to be, and they've gone, oh, you know, I'll spill that. And it's already peeling off, et cetera, et cetera. You know, basically, that in 20, 30, maybe 40 years' time, those cracks in the levees, basically, the rebar down in the middle of the levees, basically, is going to explode, and it's just going to end up wrecking them, and you're going to have to replace them. Now, if you didn't use a polymer filler, if you put bacteria into the cracks, when those bacteria meet air, because there's a crack, they craft limestone. They seal the cracks. So resilient infrastructure and self-healing infrastructure technologies are already here. Now, when we talk about the rebar itself, which is one of the biggest problems with bridges, we can 3D print polymer-based rebar to put it into concrete and it has the same tensile durability and strength as steel. But it never, ever rusts. And then when we start talking about things like asphalt, if you put magnetic filings into asphalt, when you start seeing potholes, you have a truck that has a magnet on the back of it, and the truck just drives around. And the asphalt heals itself. Because the biggest problem that you're going to have as a state, I think, is actually keeping up with the funding and everything that you need to repair the infrastructure that you've got against all these different economic, social, and political pressures. So when we have a look at self-healing infrastructure, as well as actually eliminating rebar, we can eliminate rebar with aluminium as well. So there are new concrete compounds that are coming out. There's lots of different options. And then smart infrastructure, it's all very well putting sensors into a road, for example, to measure stresses and strains and putting it into bridges. But we've got non-invasive technologies coming through. So things like hyperspectral sensors, which you can attach to drones, and the drones could just fly over the road, and they're essentially x-raying the road. And you put that into a digital twin of the state's infrastructure, run AI, and AI goes, based on the data that I've got from this piece of infrastructure, I think the strain and the loads are increasing, and I think this piece of infrastructure will fail in three years. So now you've got better project management, and you've got better foresight. So smart infrastructure, there's a lot to unpack there. But as we get to 2055, 
And we're already seeing this in the Middle East, and actually in California for a variety of reasons, autonomous sites. So we have autonomous construction sites already emerging where you can run those sites 24-7. So imagine basically taking up the roadway. At the moment, you need people, you need assets, you need to coordinate everything. Autonomous sites just means that someone punches a button and the system automatically sends the robot drones basically over to that piece of road, rips it up, puts it down. Multi-use infrastructure. So again, one of the problems we sort of see basically with roads is they're inflexible. You've got no one on that carriageway, but you've got lots of people on this carriageway. So capacity utilization. When we're talking about developing infrastructure, why can't different transport modalities use the same kind of infrastructure? You know, in China, for example, we have buses, we've got buses and trains that can come off the tracks and they can start using the roads. It's more like a tram, but hey. Um, printed infrastructure. Now, in 2020, we can already 3D print bridges, steel, concrete, and everything else. By 2055, I could, de I could demolish a bridge. And with the University of Florida, use robot drone swarms to 3D print a bridge in a couple of days. So these technologies are already coming through. But if you think about the way that we maintain and build and develop infrastructure today, we are at the start of being able to do fundamentally new things in the way that we build this infrastructure out. So that in 2055, we're not standing here saying, that bridge we built in 2023 is now rusted and falling down. We've got to take it back out. And then remote construction. So I could be here in Baton Rouge. We could have a building site or a construction site in New Orleans. And we've done this with companies like Doosan over 5G networks. I can be controlling drone machinery here, but actually building things, highways, basically down south. So companies like Colas and Arup are already starting to embrace this. Colas sent a load of drone machinery over to Africa to build a runway, but all of the operators were in London. There was not a single person in Africa. Which then gives you another opportunity, because from an opportunity perspective, if I'm sitting in Baton Rouge and I'm operating remote construction sites around Louisiana, when New York wants something built, why can't I build that from here as well? So in Germany, we actually built, we used drone, so in South Korea, we actually built buildings in South Korea where all of the construction workers were in Germany, three and a half thousand miles away. So when we talk about construction, even before we get into digital twins, virtual reality twins of all your infrastructure assets and everything else, there's a lot going on. Education, changing job markets, education equity, high rates of change, lifelong learning, personalized learning basically will increasingly be a thing. So we sort of talked about it last night, and skills shortages. Now when we actually have a look at the future of education, from a Louisiana perspective, would it be advantageous if, we, if I could actually offer every single adult and child within Louisiana a one-on-one -on -one tutor? Yeah? Because we can. So using artificial intelligence, we can already create something called adaptive learning. So these adaptive learning systems adapt to how the student learn, wants to learn. We need curriculum reform because frankly, the curriculums, basically the, the vast majority of schools are operating today, the gap between what they're teaching and the future is just getting wider. And we have ed tech. But as we start getting towards 2055, we've got artificial intelligence first learning. So I have students in the UK who are eight years old. They don't know how to code, but they're being taught how to code by artificial intelligence and they're getting good. Equal equity, because if you have an internet connection, and if you're in a rural area or in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, you can tie into these artificial intelligences. We've got immersive learning, which is sort of virtual reality learning, basically where people actually retain 64% more information. And then we've got individual tutoring. So when we have a look at job automation, AIs are getting increasingly good at automating jobs. 
One of the jobs they automate is ghostwriting. So my son, who's 10, used artificial intelligence to write this book. Now, he wrote this book in 20 minutes using ChatGPT. He doesn't know anything about art, but he got artificial intelligence to create all of the images for this book. It took six hours. So AI, on the one hand, is automating jobs, but on the other hand, it is democratizing access to skills that you do not have. You want to write a contract, go to an AI and say, I will need a contract to cover X, Y, and Z. Now, basically, you have a contract. So when we start talking about education, the only thing that every student in Louisiana ha has access to is all of the world's knowledge. Because data plus artificial intelligence plus the internet equals knowledge. The only other thing that they increasingly have access to is all of the world's skills. If you're not a coder, you can go to ChatGPT and say, write me a machine vision application that identifies failing bridges, and ChatGPT will write you the application. And then they have the ability, as we saw earlier, to bring their imagination to life and actually turn that into a business that they can scale globally. The only thing that the children basically in Louisiana and the adults in Louisiana can do today is create a company that could technically sell products to three to four billion people on the planet. How are you leveraging that power? Now, when we have a look at energy, it's a $92 trillion shift. Energy security is one of the biggest problems, which means that from Louisiana's perspective, your LNG ports basically are only going to get busier and richer. However, we can also start combining hydrogen and ammonia. When we have a look at the ammonia ports basically down in, uh, that are being built, um, the global shipping industry needs to convert from bunker fuel to net zero by 2050. They're not really going to hit it. It's part of a $364 billion transformation. And the way that most, org most cargo ships are doing that, say, for example, Maersk, Costco, is they are either retrofitting their cargo ships with LNG, which costs about $25 million per cargo ship, or they're going to go to hydrogen or ammonia. So if you've got green hydrogen and green ammonia, you can start selling that to the shipping companies. You can also then export hydrogen up north, down south. To Europe. Now, when we have a look at green hydrogen, there's a massive race for green hydrogen. In the Middle East, I do a lot of work basically with people in the Middle East, Saudis, et cetera, et cetera. They are absolutely trying to nail green hydrogen. So we've got energy price volatility. Now, at the moment, oil prices do this, right? Gas prices do this. For the industries that are in Louisiana, that's a massive, massive problem. When we have a look at renewable energy, gas, wind, solar, uh, as well as hydrogen, the price is this. In fact, it goes down. So industries in Louisiana will love the green hydrogen and blue hydrogen that you'll be producing. So you can start hooking these industries up together. Growing demand, industry electrification, so that applies obviously to transportation and logistics as well. And then we've got legacy grids. Now, when we have a look at energy innovation, it's just staggering. So for any oil and gas fields within Louisiana, if you put bacteria down those wells, you can produce what we call gold hydrogen. So any wells, basically, that are end of life, put bacteria down them, you've got gold hydrogen. Uh, we've got biogas, biohydrogen, and sustainable aviation fuels, basically, which can be funded by the agricultural sector. So sustainable aviation fuels you can't get enough of that globally if you're, a, if you're an airline at the moment. Um, and Heathrow, basically, we've just spent 15 million, 15 million pounds building massive sustainable aviation fuel um, bunkers and depots. You've also got solar. So this was alluded to earlier. Uh, one, of the, in, one of the companies in the state is sucking carbon dioxide out of the air and turning it into blue diesel or green diesel. So essentially what we're doing is we're taking hydrocarbons out of the air using catalysts and then turning that into diesel, which we can increasingly then just put into the diesel power cars. Um, when we have a look at renewables, we've got a variety of things going on there. Obviously, hydro. Now, when we actually have a look at Louisiana, when we have a look at the oceanic assets, you've got wind farms, but over in 
over in Japan, they're putting hydro in the deep sea. So deep sea hydro from companies like Hitachi, they reckon they can generate 200 gigawatts per, you know, out of uh, those assets. So when you actually have a look at the deep seas around Louisiana, bearing in mind that climate change might start wiping out some of the wind farms, deep sea hydro is very good. Wireless energy, um, increasingly, basically, you know, with the US Department of Defense, we can beam energy typically a couple of kilometers now. So that means we don't have to have the pylons. We can just beam electricity straight from one community to another. Carbon capture and storage. Um, Lots going on in the uh, lithium-ion space. So, for example, with lithium-ion batteries and wind farms, are there any recycling centers within Louisiana? That's a massive business. Um, so they can get connected up. Ammonia, we've already seen that. Nuclear, structural batteries, we can turn the car itself into a battery. So if you think electric vehicles today have got lithium-ion batteries, you move to solar. So we put solar panels, especially on the top of the cars. Now. From that perspective, we've already got that being done by uh, Lightyear One, Toyota, Hyundai, BMW. So if you think basically that your cars are always going to be powered by lithium ion batteries, we're already starting to switch in some spaces. And it just goes on. But we've got decentralized energy generation, global supergrids, peer-to-peer -peer trading, vehicle to grid. So for example, when we look at vehicle to grid, Increasingly, companies like Tesla, you take the electricity in a vehicle and you use that to boost the Louisiana grid when it needs it. Um, we've got virtual power plants. Electric vehicles, like Tesla's, are actually virtual power plants. They all contain electricity. You plug them into the grid at night, and when we need it, we just switch. We've got autonomous grids, autonomous utilities, space-based generation, wireless energy transmission, and zero cost energy generation. When we have a look at solar and when we have a look at wind, the graph basically per, the cost per megawatt hour is just this. We're now at $0.2 per megawatt hour for solar, unsubsidized, which means that the cost of generating electricity with these technologies is literally falling to zero. Finance, big wealth inequality, depressed wage growth, digital currencies, faster payment networks, increasing equity and uninsurable risks. From a Louisiana perspective, the one that you're probably going to have to grapple with is increasing uninsurability. Because you can build all the infrastructure you like, but if it gets wiped out and if it's uninsured or uninsurable or the premiums are massively high, you're going to end up with an issue. Now, from a finance perspective, we've got alternative payments and networks. We've got bank four, crypto, decentralized assets, P2P payments, and same-day payments. Now, alternative payments, for example, Nike will let you buy products with moves. IKEA will let you buy products with time. So when we talk about the future of payments and money, it's very different to what you might actually think. But you can also put these payment networks into autonomous vehicles. So now you have peer-to-peer -peer payments within autonomous vehicles. We've got different kinds of money coming through, capital without banks, central bank digital currencies. We have a look at healthcare, declining life spans, unfortunately, in the US at the moment, decreasing equity, increasing costs, lifestyle and disease burden is increasing. So actually non-contagious diseases are now actually killing more people than contagious diseases. 60% of people are dying because basically their lifestyle choices, not because they've actually got a virus or a bug. And we've got staff shortages. So increasingly, healthcare is artificial intelligence led, quantified self. So that's where your smartwatch takes all of your biometric data and then starts saying, by the way, you're getting a little bit ill. Telehealth, this is a tricorder. It's not a smartphone. Um, and then when we have a look at things like predictive diagnosis, increasingly we can take the data from your body and say you are going to be ill in two weeks' time. Or people like you with these kinds of conditions live this long. Doctors at home, so rather than having to go to a GP surgery, for example, we saw it with COVID. People just didn't have to actually move because they just did this stuff from home. Personalized medicine, remote surgeries manufacturing, 
we're seeing significant changes basically from corporate blacklisting, which means that you have to change the countries that you work with and the companies that you work with, which brings everything to friendshoring. So from a manufacturing perspective with the IRA and the CHIPS Act, we're seeing manufacturing attempted to be brought back to the United States. So that has an impact on supply chains, logistics, and so on and so forth. But from a customer perspective, increasingly we're seeing the rise of customization because they want customized products. We're seeing generalized robots, which mean that we see the rise of dark factories, just-in-time supply chains as well, and then robotic automation. Moving to 2055, companies like Nike, Adidas, and everything else are already on this trend. We just 3D print stuff basically in the, in the factory. Biomanufacturing is an increasing area as well, um, which would tie in basically with the Louisiana biotech scene. Dark manufacturing is where we have no people within the factories. Flattened supply chains, I don't need to ship stuff through the Louisiana port because I just 3D printed it in Lafayette. I didn't have to get the components from somewhere else on the planet. And then on-demand production. So a little bit like bridges, I need a new bridge, AI designs it, systems, and then robotics 3D print it. Retail trends, increasingly e-commerce will dominate, so we're seeing a doubling basically in e-commerce revenues at the moment in this field. But increasingly, it's going to be on demand. Now, as we start seeing on demand get better, you might very well end up with more smaller trips. Because if we have drone deliveries, for example, people might be buying smaller amounts of things, but having them delivered more regularly. Robo customers, increasingly, your fridge is buying your products for you. And super apps. By digital products, I used to buy a physical Adidas trainer, now I'm buying a virtual Adidas trainer. So this is what the kids are doing. When we look at digital assets, social commerce, if you want to disrupt Amazon, the way that you do that is with super apps. So if Mercedes had a super app, you could buy all your goods through the Mercedes super app, not via WhatsApp. And then we've got metaverse commerce as we head to 25 as well. Telecoms trends, the only things that change here, network density and speed, over-the-top communications, spectrum congestion, and wireless first. So we move from 5G to 6G, sort of by 2030, 2040. Then we move to space-based comms. So for the rural areas, you want to hook up a rural area, you take out a contract with SpaceX's Starlink, they're connected. And then we have terabit backhauls on the fiber. Now, moving to 2055, we have 7G quantum communications, which is a completely different kind of communications technology. So 6G and 7G technologies will be operating at the terabit per second speeds, which has a significant impact, basically, on smart infrastructure as well as autonomous vehicles. And we have petabit backhauls. Now, from a transport perspective, we will continue to switch to alternative fuels, autonomous vehicles, dark warehouses. So dark warehouses are just fully autonomous fulfillment centers. Amazon reckons that in about eight years' time, they will be able to fire almost all of their warehouse staff because the robots will be able to pick everything. And the only reason that Amazon haven't been able to do it up so far is because they, in their own words, have millions of SKUs. So dark warehouses. Across the United States, we're seeing the massive build-out of warehouse space. Huge amounts of warehouse space. Industry electrification, just-in-time fulfillment. I've ordered my goods. I want them to fulfilled as soon as possible. Last mile automation and quantum routing. So last mile automation, 70% of the cost of a delivery is last mile. So companies like UPS are increasingly trying to incorporate drone deliveries as part of their delivery networks. So the person goes off and delivers a package while the drones pop out the top of the van and go off and do stuff. Which means basically that when you have a look at urban air mobility systems, you need new air traffic control systems. And then again, from a transportation perspective, we've got aging infrastructure, legacy infrastructure, multimodal networks, rigid infrastructure. One kind of infrastructure only does one thing. The rail network only takes a rail, uh, only takes a train. 
the road network only takes trucks and cars and things with wheels. Capacity issues and congestion, air and noise pollution, micro-mobility increasingly is a trend. Poor vehicle utilisation, poor experiences, no one wants to be stuck in traffic, and rising accident rates. Now, this means that from a transportation perspective, we kind of need to look at it through these lenses. So firstly, you need a digital core. So digitize every single part, basically, of the transportation system and network, the, phys the physical assets, everything. Because when you digitize it, you can then start optimizing it, you can then start reading information from it, you can start doing predictive analysis, get rid of bureaucracy, because if it takes you too long to actually do come up with a decision, then you're going to miss the boat. And if you don't think that you can actually get rid of bureaucracy, during COVID, you did things basically that would have taken years to get through the legislation in days. Figure out what you did during COVID to get things done and then make that your business as usual. In Bahrain, they stood up a hospital in three days at the airport. So just figure out what you did there. Because you can actually move at speed. It's, a, it's generally believed that governments can't move at speed. They can. And you did during COVID. But what did you do differently during that time? You had leaders that just said, get on with it. Whatever. You had people take the roadblocks away. Now. We've got fully autonomous trucks and ships and cargo ships coming through, um, teleoperated trucks. When we have a look at cars, so for example, we've got fully autonomous boats coming through. We've got fully autonomous cars coming through. Category three at the moment, but category five cars, really you're looking at 2030. And then you've got to start rolling it out. Planes, Airbus are developing planes that are fully autonomous. They've already been flying them out of Charles de Gaulle. And then we've got fully autonomous trains already, basically, in Germany and Australia. But if you have fully autonomous vehicles, cars especially, you have 30% fewer cars. Now, when we make a car fully autonomous or a vehicle fully autonomous, we also have this. You've got the death of the car already. Because if I take the steering wheel, the dashboard, and the pedals out of a car, I have a pod. And this gives you an opportunity. Because if you're now talking about pods, not cars, we now have blank space as a service, which gives you new opportunities. So public transportation, bearing in mind that you have different mod modalities, as a department of transport, if you had a super app, you could say, well, actually, we've got a eight-seater vehicle, and it could be a meeting room on wheels, or a shop, or a GP surgery. So blank space as a service actually opens up a variety of different opportunities, basically, for the state to actually create a super app and actually sell different services in different ways. We've got loads of these kinds of concepts coming through. So increasingly, vehicles will be modular, which means that we have different distribution centers. So the chassis on all these vehicles are the same. And we see this with Mercedes. We see this with uh, companies like Renault and so on and so forth. In the morning, the vehicle is a personal transport vehicle and it's fully autonomous. Then it comes back to a depot, you take the top off, the chassis off, and you now switch on a new chassis and it's a delivery vehicle. Then it comes back, you take the chassis off, and it's a truck or it's a bus or whatever it happens to be. But when we have a look at things like medical services and shops, companies like Toyota with the e pallet you just call up a fully autonomous shop. So when we talk about rural areas not being able to have access to different services, I just send my fully autonomous medical service, my fully autonomous shop, my fully autonomous waste management system. But we also have this. So Disney, we're increasingly talking about using these, hotel room as a service. So I fly into New Orleans, I need to get to say to Dallas, I could just have a hotel room turn up at the airport. And that airport then docks with this, which is a hotel. So this is unimodal transportation. I come out of New Orleans Airport, I get into my hotel room, I travel to Dallas, wherever I'm going, and then it docks basically with this hotel. 
Now, in terms of business models, if you have a car that has solar panels on the roof, it's generating electricity. So this is state. This can be public transport. So this car is public transport. It's generating electricity via solar panels. It's an electricity generator. These are from companies like Toyota and so on and so forth. Now I can do this. My public transport is generating electricity and now wirelessly it can transmit that electricity to other trucks or other vehicles that are pl platooning near it and sell that electricity. So BMW can generate electricity and then sell the electricity this car produces to the car in front and then charge money for it. So now the Department of Transport in Louisiana could actually be an energy generator and an energy distributor which helps you close funding gaps. In California, Tesla is a virtual power plant company. So if you have buses with lithium ion batteries, they plug in, they can send battery, uh, they can send electricity to the Louisiana grid and sell it. So now you've got new revenue sources for the Department of Transport. And these can sell electricity to anywhere on the planet that needs it. And then Tesla is eventually becoming a robo-taxi company. So when we talk about the business model of transportation and new revenue earning opportunities, there's a lot that's changing. Street life, we've got robot dogs, drones, robots and scooters. We've got Hyperloops. Having a bit of a stuttery problem at the moment with Hyperloops. But DP World are investing in Hyperloops across India because you can move goods at the speed of flight for the cost of trucking. And then when we talk about urban air mobility vehicles, if we know that infrastructure in the future is going to be increasingly costly to build, repair, insure, and everything else, is this actually an option? Because this is kind of infrastructureless transport. There are no roads to flood if you go straight to flying cars and flying taxis. There's no bridge to get destroyed. So is there an opportunity to look at infrastructureless transportation? And even though these are, these are wacky and wild, the cost per mile of these is now below an Uber Black. And then you just rent them as a service. New kinds of infrastructure. We've got hypersonic and supersonic aircraft coming through around the world. And then that's it. So I hope you enjoyed that. There's a lot to go through because we're covering not just a broad range of sectors and trends, but because we're also trying to go 30 plus years out. And the only things that are changing is everything. But there are lots of opportunities to do new things in new ways, fun things in new ways, and I hope I've shown you uh, a couple of those ways. So thank you for your attention.